Hi, I'm Rob Huff, this year racing for Toyota Gazoo Racing UK in British Touring Car Championship. Very, very happy to be here. 20 years away, Huffy's homecoming year, what can we say? Started my career very much, my professional career in, in BTCC in 2004 with Sayat. Had the most amazing year as a, as a rookie, obviously teammates with Jason Plato, which was phenomenal to, to have the experience of Jason alongside you when you're you know, a wee young pup. And yeah, then obviously ventured off around the world for a few years, might have won a world championship and uh, challenged for a few more. Yeah, 2024, the year to come home. Just feel it's right, you know, everything seemed to click into place really perfectly for this year for me. Did knock ill as a one-off last year with Team Hard, which was a very fun event. Just great to get back into the BTCC paddock and I guess a bit of a test, a bit of a gauge for what sort of reaction I would get back in the paddock and I couldn't have been more pleasantly surprised. It was just, it was exactly as I left it, you know, 20 years ago, a few different faces obviously, but the fundamentals, the, the experience, the, just the vibe in the paddock was exactly what I remembered it to be. And it just inspired me to, to go, right, now I know exactly where I want to go and, and what I want to do. Then it's a case of, right, once you've made that decision, where do you go? What team, what car, all the rest of it. Obviously spoke to pretty much everyone on the grid. and just got the most amazing vibe from, from, from Speedworks, from Christian and Amy. It just felt right, you know, it, it just seemed to gel very quickly. We seemed to be on a very similar wavelength of the way we think and the way the preparation, everything. Watched obviously from the outside, I came to Silverstone, came to Brands Hatch, had a few more meetings. And not very long after the final race, I was in the, the car at Croft, which was a brilliant experience. Thoroughly enjoyed myself, gelled really well with the team, with the engineers, again with Christian and with Amy, with everyone you know, involved in the project. And for me, it was, it was just like a switch, you know, for me that that's, that's where I need to be. That's what I want to do. And I want to do it with Speedworks. I want to do it with Toyota Gazoo Racing UK. And uh, here we are. Yeah, I mean, you can go back even further. You know, my route into motorsport has been quite unique, I guess, quite different to, to most. No one in my family is within motorsport. No one we knew was really in motorsport, let's say. My dad, Peter, as everyone knows, was a huge fan of motorsport. My sort of tag team partner throughout my, my career, if you like, wherever I was, he was. And even places I wasn't, he was there as well. But, uh, you know, he was a huge fan of motorsport. My love of motorsport very much comes from, from my dad. Early days of karting and stuff, you know, we never did the, the, the full Monty karting as, as we know, sort of professional karting, if you like. We very much did sort of indoor karting. And then I think when I was 16, we, we did outdoor karting, you know, and at the time, I don't think you could even get in a go-kart till you were 10. So literally my first, my 10th birthday, it was when all the indoor go-karting tracks started popping up in the early 90s. Uh, dad and some of his mates started to, we had one very local to us. So they sort of entered a team and started doing it. I'll go and hold the pit board out and pester them to, to let me have a go. And then it was, yeah, then it was just sort of the, the natural progression, but very much a family thing, a family team. Karting all the way up until I was, I think, 19 years old. 19th birthday, I think it was. Went to Silverstone to Jim Russell Race School, the week-long intensive course, did my racing license. And what I never knew at the time, because we didn't know about motorsport, was that each race school, I think there was about 18 Jim Russell Race Schools all over the world. And that intensive course happened twice a year, I think it was. The instructors and the, the coaches on the, that course would choose their three or four best pupils from students from throughout the year. And you got an invitation into the Jim Russell World Scholarship, which again, we knew nothing about, didn't even know what it was. Invited to Silverstone, three day knockout competition. There was about 85 young drivers there doing it. And it was a day by day, you know, your name got read out, you were through to the next day, or I think it was even mornings and afternoons and people got knocked out. Somehow found ourselves in the final six. The prize was a year in Formula Vauxhall Junior. And uh, somehow my name was read out as the winner of, of that scholarship. So that put me into Formula Vauxhall Junior. Again, didn't really know what we were doing, but thoroughly enjoyed the experience, went with it. Won the championship in the first year, which was amazing. Then it's like, okay, now what do you do? Where do you go? Formula Palmer Audi had a winter series. So when it did the winter series of Formula Palmer Audi, obviously big step up in car with power, with wings compared to a, a for, Formula uh, Vauxhall. Did that, I think we finished second in the championship in the winter series. I think, you don't quote me on that, it was a long time ago. Uh, 
jumped up was when Kimi Rackinen had won Formula Renault UK, went straight to Sauber Formula One. Obviously, the entries were being herded in for Formula Renault UK, massive championship. We raised enough money to about half the season in that, but unfortunately ran out of money. And, and uh, again, we were all doing it as a, a family. You know, Dad was trying to uh, help raise money and all the rest of it. Uh, we had some, some of Dad's friends help out, you know, which was, was huge for us. But yeah, got halfway through the season, uh, effectively ran out of money and, and that was game over at that point. And then I was, uh, so I think, I can't remember if it was my sister or my mum, there was an auto car magazine at home and in it, Tim Sugden's Be A Racing Driver dot com scholarship for Renault Clio Cup. You could be a complete novice, you could be an experienced driver. I think it was it was quite clever with it. It was like £200 a round, but I think everyone that entered did every round. So he was quite clever with it. But the winner got um, a, a full season in Renault Clio Cup with Tim Sugden. Entered that. It was quite cool actually, because when I was testing this at Croft, we were sitting in the same room that I won that scholarship in. So sitting in a very wet, cold croft at about eight o'clock on a Sunday evening. And the judges came back and read my name out as the winner, which again was just, you know, incredible. Went on, had a fantastic season in Clear Cup, my first year of saloon cars with Tim Sugden, who ran a hell of a team. I think they'd won the year before with Danny Buxton. And Danny was one of the coaches who chose me to win it. And I think the first race of the year, or second race of the year, we were Thruxton, Danny and I were first and second on the grid. So that was that was an interesting story for another time. But now obviously Danny's involved in Speedworks as well. So, you know, it's amazing how these paths sort of you know, go away and come back. So obviously been involved with Danny a lot with, with getting this organized for this year. Did Clio Cup and then I finished third in Renault Clio Cup. And then it was, that was the sort of difficult stage of, okay, now what do we do? Because I think the winner of a Clio Cup I think Renault had just announced they were finishing in BTCC. The winner of the Clio Cup won a road car, I think it was, or even a race car at the time, but a Clio Cup. And of course, in motorsport, you're always looking at the next step. You know, where's this path leading? And at the time, I was a BRDC rising star. So I called the BRDC and I said, look, can you, you know, give me someone to have a meeting with that can give me some advice? And they were obviously very helpful. They said, yes, of course. Hooked me up with Howden Ganley which was a wonderful experience to sit with Howden in the BRDC and just discuss through his career, obviously, as well as, as mine, get some great advice from him. And at the time, Sayat had just announced Sayat Cooper Championship UK, brand new championship, I think 20 cars, all run under the same roof by one team. And the prize was huge. The prize was British Touring Car Drive. Well, I think at the time, to start with, it was European Touring Car Drive with Seat in a works car, a salary and a flat in Monaco. I can't remember the exact price of it and all the rest of it, but anyway, Howden said to me, look, you've got to go, you've got to look for the next steps, you've got to look at the follow-ons, you've got to see where, where the career path you know, is. And with Renault, it very much sort of, if you win the championship, it kind of stops there because they don't have anything following on from that. But obviously with the Seat thing, it was a brand new championship. Everyone's obviously very wary of brand new one mate championships. How are the cars going to run? How's it all going to run? Is it going to be reliable, the cars and, and so on and so forth? How does said, no, you've got to go to this new Sat Cooper championship. So Birmingham NEC show, Autosport show, 2003. I was the first person to put pen to paper. Again, I think we sort of uh, managed somehow to, to, to raise the funds, but it it was the first time we managed to raise the funds before the season had started. You know, mum and dad put a lot into it, obviously. I put some money in. We had the local SAT dealership. Again, some of our family friends put money in to, to help us out and came away with winning it, which was just the most surreal thing. I'll never forget the last race of the year was Thruxton. I won the first race of the day and that, that sealed the championship for me. Second race of the day, uh, I'd already won the championship, but got a puncher. And that's how easily motorsport could have flipped around on me, right? If that had happened in the first race, who knows what would have happened in the, in the second race. So yeah, that put me into BTCC with, with, with Sayat, uh, with RML running the car and with Jason Plato as my teammate. So with no scholarships now, I don't think you could take the same path that I took because although there are fantastic scholarships uh, around, I kind of want to say that our naivety of not knowing much about motorsport is probably what helped in the sense of taking those those paths because it was the only way. And we never set out to be, you know, we're, Dad and I, as a family, we never sat down and went, right, we're going to try and progress Rob to be a professional driver. It never, even when I won the Sat Cooper Championship and became a professional driver, I still don't think it registered at the time 
that this is actually a career, that you could do it. I don't think I ever even knew that it could be a job, let's say. So everything was, I mean, it's just, you know, thinking about it now, I'm kind of daydreaming about it because it, it was so surreal, the whole, the whole, you know, route that we took, the way we got there, the people that helped along the way. It's been quite the remarkable journey. Yeah, very much thrust in the deep end because the first teammates I really ever, so I had a teammate uh, in Joey Foster in Formula Vauxhall Junior, who we know Joey from Walter Hayes, absolute legend in, in Formula Ford racing. And then uh, Formula Renault, I didn't have a teammate. Palmer Audi, you're all under the same roof. Clio Cup was the first time I had teammates, but they were both sort of gentleman drivers. And then the South Cooper Championship was all under one roof. So again, no teammates. My first real teammate was, was Jason Plato. So that was a bit of a shocker. <laughs> we all know Jason, obviously, very well. Uh, Jason's a good friend of mine still now, you know. Uh, spoke to him two days ago. So it was exactly what I wanted it to be because I was, uh, you know, I, I knew nothing. I literally knew nothing. I knew I was good. I knew I was fast. I knew I was capable. But that's not enough. You know, you need to really know the ins and outs and the workings and, and how to deal with different situations. And the number one thing, of course, is, is, is making the best you can of the worst situations to recover. They're the days that really change your life. They're the ones that change and make your career. Jason and I learned so much from, you know, I really soaked everything up like a spider. I remember sitting in debriefs, like, you know, a little bit starstruck, obviously, because I've grown up watching JP on, on Grandstand in Super Tours and all the rest of it. And yeah, just, just soaked as much of it up uh, as I could. And I, I remember saying to RML, because it was the first time I'd raced with such a, you know, they're a huge outfit. They were running LMP one or two cars for Le Mans out of one side of the, the factory, they're running the touring cars out of the other side. And I just said to them, look, you know, I'm, treat me as a blank piece of paper. Uh, anything you see that you like, you don't like, please, you know, help me because I know nothing. And, and, they, and they, they did. And again, I think that was something that really helped in those early years, you know, getting it, you know, being molded by a team like RML, being helped out by Jason a lot, by learning from him. And with the limited time you have, on track and off track in BTCC, you have to learn fast. And, uh, and fast we learned. To, to say, you know, on paper that my first four real teammates were Jason Plato, Nicola Larini, Alain Menu, Ivan Muller. There's not much of a harder school of knocks for entering motorsport at professional levels. So, and I've, you know, I have to thank all of those guys because without being up against them, I wouldn't have been able to achieve what I achieved. I wouldn't be as successful as I have been. I wouldn't be as good as I am today. So, you know, I thank you, gentlemen. It's tough, you know, it's really, really tough. And you've got to have a lot of confidence in yourself. You've got to have a lot of self-belief. And, and yeah, you can't be a wimp. You can't be broken easily because those boys will break you fast. I still have to pinch myself because, you know, you, uh, motorsport's a bit of a weird one because you don't get to enjoy being a champion for very long before you're straight back into it, what, three months later? I think the World Championship was two months because we finished in December and we were straight back in the cars in January, first race normally at end of Feb. So you, you don't get long to enjoy being a champion before you're thrown straight back in. But the eight years that I was with Chevrolet were the, just the most amazing years. You know, the World Touring Car Championship was huge. Uh, we had, what, eight, nine manufacturers uh, in the end. I think we had, you know, there was one race I remember at Monza that we had about 42 cars, you know, and, and it was, didn't matter whether you were at the front, the middle, or the back, it was super competitive. I mean, looking back, I kind of don't know how, as individual drivers, that we did it because it was so intense. It really was intense. And it's one thing racing in a championship like that where you as an individual, uh, of a team of three or four cars, one car has a chance against other teams and other manufacturers. It brings a whole different dynamic when you're starting the season knowing that you three have got the fastest car and no one else can touch you and it's gonna be between you three. That changes things. Yeah, I mean, Macau is just magical. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, what, what do you do because Macau is not just about being the fastest driver and going out and winning. You, you need luck. In motorsport, you need luck. I mean, I wouldn't have got to where I am today without quite a lot of luck. And like you said earlier, being right place, right time. But of course you do need, you don't even need luck. You just don't need bad luck. You want to, you know, the bad luck needs to, to stay down. Macau is a complete lottery. 
you know, I remember the first time I, I drove there, I just felt that this was a place for me. It was a bit like Thruxton in the UK. Thruxton was my best track in the UK. And you can kind of compare Thruxton and Macau. I mean, Macau is basically Thruxton with walls, right? So they are quite similar speed-wise and all the rest of it. But yeah, my success in Macau, again, is something that I'm not quite sure I fully understand or believe. Got an email just pre-COVID, so end of 2018 or 19, I got an email that I thought was a prank from my friends from Mad Adam Two Swords Hong Kong saying that I'd been highly requested by the fans of Macau uh, Mad Adam Two Swords to, to, to have a, a wax figure made. I ignored it because I thought it was my mates having a prank. About a month later I got another email, I ignored that one. And about two weeks after that I then got a phone call from a lovely Chinese lady who personally invited me to come out to, uh, on a, and it was, so I now have a full blown Madame Two Swords in uh, Macau. It's just the most spectacular place. It, honestly, it's, and it's not just because I've won that. You ask anyone who's raced in Macau, it is the scariest, most mind boggling, unpredictive place on the planet. You know, it, it is, you, you, I don't think you could get away with trying to recreate it because of the history of Macau. It's, let's say, allowed, but if you tried to recreate that somewhere else today, it, they would simply just look at you like you're bonkers. I've never been here before, and they're kind of secret, right? I mean, you'd never almost know it was here unless you know it's here. You don't, you would never know it's here. And like you said, the, the, the vastness of this place is, is huge. Did a little shakedown in the car this morning on the test track that they've got here. You know, that's how big this place is. There's a test track, and the test track is probably the smallest part of the whole facility. It's mind boggling how big this place is, but obviously a huge thank you to Toyota UK for allowing us to come here today and launch the new car and, and launch uh, myself coming back to the championship. But this opportunity for me is very special, you know, to, to get this opportunity, like I said to you earlier, everything just kind of, it just clicked into place, step after step after step after step. And I've not been as excited for the start of the championship as I've been this one for a very, very long time. So yeah, Huffy back in BTCC is, uh, is igniting my fire. Uh, entertainingly? Uh, for me, you know, I'm, I don't need to prove anything. I think I'm, uh, I've done well enough in my career to not need to worry about making a name for myself. You know, for, for me, this is just a, a wonderful place to be 20 years later, but I'm not here to mince about. I'm, you know, very much here to, to get stuck in. I'm, I'm here to, to win a championship for Speedworks, for Toyota, and tick that missing box on my CV that only had one year of BTCC in it. So yeah, I, I, I fully, understand and appreciate the, the the level of driving in BTCC. You know, I did that one off in 17. I did the one off last year at Knock Hill. Uh, it's not easy. It's, it's a very, very tough championship, but I've never shied away from uh, putting myself up against the best. And uh, we'll see this year what happens.